One of the challenges with photographing scale models is keeping the entire model in focus. Small objects like our models require that the camera be close to the subject relative to the focal length of the lens. And sometimes this can prove challenging as it exceeds the optical capabilities of the lens and camera to render a satisfactory depth of field. Depth of field is defined as the range of distance that appears acceptably sharp. There is nothing precise about range, appears, or acceptably. The reason depth of field can be confusing is that we're talking about perception. Small wonder one of the key components used to explain depth of field is termed circle of confusion. In fact, photographers can't even agree how to pronounce the term for one of its most overused artistic effects, the out-of-focus background. Some of the variables that can affect depth of field are focus distance, aperture of the lens, diffraction, depth of focus, sensor size, post-processing, and print size. How these factors relate to each other can also be affected by the hardware. Not all cameras, lenses, and displays are the same. So while I'll be talking about individual factors that affect depth of field, this information is basically a guideline. Ultimately, you have to do some playing around to maximize the results with the equipment you have available. Depth of field doesn't change abruptly from unsharp to sharp. The transition is gradual. In fact, everything in front or in back of the actual focusing distance appears to loop sharpness, although it may not be perceived by our eyes. The term circle of confusion is used to describe how much a point needs to be blurred in order to be perceived as unsharp. When the circle of confusion becomes perceptible to our eyes, the area is said to be outside the depth of field. One rule of thumb is that a circle is considered acceptably sharp when it would go unnoticed in a standard 8x10 print viewed from one foot away. Camera manufacturers assume a circle of confusion to be negligible if it isn't larger than ten thousandths of an inch. This is the standard that they use for the depth of field markers you see on the lenses. However, a person with 20-20 vision can distinguish features one-third this size, so in reality the circle of confusion needs to be much smaller to be acceptably sharp. Depth of field can also be based on when the circle of confusion is larger than the sensor's pixels. This diagram illustrates how the circle of confusion occurs. The size of the circle has been greatly exaggerated to make a point. In reality, the circle would only fall on a small fraction of the sensor. The two most common variables you can use to control depth of field are focus distance and aperture of the lens. Simply watching the lens depth of field markers will demonstrate how depth of field increases as the focus distance increases. So rather than filling the viewfinder with the subject, you can easily increase the depth of field if you back off from the model or zoom out a bit if you're using a zoom lens. However, you don't want to move back so far that you finally end up with a low resolution image. Here you see the model's been photographed at three different distances. But when cropped to yield a similarly sized image, you can see the improvements in depth of field. This effect has nothing to do with the focal length of the lens. Looking at this chart, you can see that if the focus distance changes along with the focal length of the lens, then there's no change in the depth of field. In other words, if the size of the subject is kept constant, the depth of field stays basically the same with any focal length lens. What does change is the distribution of the depth of field. You can see from this chart that the depth of field is more gradual behind the focal plane in a wide angle lens. The second common variable is the aperture of the lens. The smaller the aperture, the greater the depth of field. You can see from this series the increase in the depth of field as the lens is stopped down. There are two considerations when using small f-stops, diffraction and depth of focus. Diffraction is an optical effect that occurs when light is bent as it passes through a hole. 
All lenses exhibit some sort of diffraction and it increases with smaller f-stops like f22 or 32. In this animation, you can see the resulting form as the aperture becomes smaller. As these formations hit the sensor, this creates a pattern of concentric circles on the sensor. The central portion is known as an airy disk. When the size of the airy disk exceeds the pixel size of the sensor, then diffraction starts to become visible. Here you can see how the airy disk increases in size as the aperture size is made smaller. The grid pattern represents the pixel size on a Canon 50D. Compare these two images, one shot at f5.6 and the other at f32. The point of focus is the number 9. Looking at 100%, you can see that the 9 is sharper in the f5.6 image. However, as you move away from the point of focus, the sharpness decreases rapidly. In the image at f32, more of the image is clearer, but the point of focus is soft. This is diffraction. Not all lenses handle diffraction the same, and every lens has its sweet spot, which is usually two stops down from its maximum aperture. From the perspective of a real world, you look at the F32 image cropped and sized and then sharpened, and you might find this acceptable, depending on your application. The second consideration is depth of focus. A rudimentary way to think about depth of focus is to think of depth of field, but between the lens and the sensor. The angle of the light and how well it's focused on the sensor plane creates its own sort of circle of confusion. How this relates to the individual pixels on the sensor can have an effect on the image sharpness. Large apertures create wider angles that have a narrower depth of focus. The smaller apertures result in a narrower beam that has a greater depth of focus. Another way to affect how light is focused on the sensors by manipulating the lens plane. The most common example is a large format view camera. However, the same mechanics can be adapted for a small format camera as well using bellows and rails, and to a lesser degree with a single lens known as a tilt-shift lens. These lenses typically offer a degree of swing or tilt depending on the rotation of the lens, and the lens can be shifted to correct convergence. In this example, I'm using a 90mm tilt-shift lens to see if it'll help improve the depth of field. Using what's known as Scheinflug's principle, the lens is swung at an angle somewhere between the image plane and the focal plane. Unfortunately, the limited movement won't allow enough swing. So while you see a significant amount of improvement, you'll also see the limitations of this type of a lens. Sensor size can also have an effect on the depth of field, and I'm not even going to attempt to go down the black hole of the physics why. However, if you want to know more about it, there are a number of articles on the web. But just to generalize, smaller sensors have the potential for a greater depth of field. But like most things in photography, there's a compromise, and smaller sensors have their own set of negatives. Even though we do our best to maximize depth of field optically, how the image is manipulated and processing can mitigate many of our limitations. For instance, just reducing the original image size has the effect of sharpening the entire image. An image that looks soft at the width of, say, 5500 pixels will appear sharper when reduced to 1200 pixels. And if the image is destined for the web, it might look just fine. In addition to size reduction, we can apply a degree of sharpening. My favorite tool for sharpening an image suffering from diffraction is a Photoshop plugin known as Focus Magic. This sharpening tool uses deconvolution rather than the unsharp mask to restore some of the sharpness. Another Photoshop sharpening plugin that I frequently use is PhotoKit Sharpener. This tool uses a layer-based sharpening system that allows for some fine tuning. When evaluating sharpness, you always want to be at 100%, which is a one-to-one -one pixel representation. I also try and avoid oversharpening. It should never look obvious. In fact, this is a good general rule whenever you're working on an image. After exploring a number of factors and their relationships to one another, I want to introduce a different approach to depth of field known as focus stacking.
This method uses a series of images refocused at intervals along the area we want in focus. The images are then merged into a single image that has a depth of field greater than what you could achieve with the camera and lens alone. When you refocus the lens, you change the size of the image slightly, so the software has to resize each image and then combine them to use the portions that's most in focus. It can be done in Photoshop, but it's slow and clunky, and when the results are hit and miss, it's really best handled by a dedicated focus stacking software. The two most popular are Xerine Stacker and Helicon Focus. My personal preference is Helicon Focus. I especially like the remote module that automates the capture process and the fact that it handles RAW files and returns a DNG. Briefly, here's how it works. With the camera tethered to the computer, you open the application and select Remote. At this point, you're controlling the camera with the computer. You select the nearest point of the image you want in focus. Using the arrow buttons, adjust the focus. Then lock the focus as point A. Next, shift to the furthest point you want in focus. Focus that point and lock it into B. Under the interval setting, you can select auto and the software will calculate an interval and the number of shots. I usually increase the intervals because I'm less concerned about the number of shots and time as I am about the result. Select Shoot and the software will expose a series of images refocused at specific intervals. Once it's collected all the images, you return to Helicon Focus. You select Render, and Helicon Focus then goes to work and combines all the images. Checking the image over, you can see that it's sharp from beginning to end. Here's the image opened in Camera Raw, and you can see that at 100%, the image is completely sharp. Keep in mind that the locomotive is 21 inches in length, and here's the final image. You could collect your series of images manually and just use Helicon Focus to process them. However, I found my results to be more reliable when I've automated the process with the remote feature. So there's a number of ways you can improve depth of field. If your equipment's limited, you can at least increase your focal distance and stop down your lens. If you want to approach the issue optically, you could use a shift tilt lens or bellows. And finally, if you're comfortable with working with images on the computer, you can use focus stacking to take depth of field beyond what you could achieve traditionally. I hope this video has given you some food for thought. And in the next installment of this series, I'll be talking about managing color.